Hi, I am attorney Marie Chris Batan Lasco. This is my virtual classroom. Welcome to my YouTube channel. In this channel, I shall aim to simplify the law. I shall discuss concepts and principles of law in under 10 minutes. In this video, I would like to talk about divisible and indivisible obligations. When we talk about divisible and indivisible obligations, we should be careful not to confuse this with solidary obligations. Your divisible and indivisible obligations are covered by Articles 1223 to 1225 of your Civil Code, while your joint and solidary obligations are covered by 1207 to 1222 of your Civil Code. So let's start to talk about divisible and indivisible obligations. As I've mentioned, this is covered by Articles 1223 to 1225. Let's begin with 1223. It says, the divisibility or indivisibility of the things that are the object of obligations in which there is only one debtor and only one creditor does not alter or modify the provisions of Chapter 2 of this title. Now, when you look at your civil code, Chapter 2 actually covers joint and solidary obligations. What 1223 is telling you is that when you classify your obligation as divisible or indivisible, it does not change that such obligation may be joint or solidary. What do we mean by that? It basically means that when we classify an obligation as joint or solidary, it actually refers to the tie between the parties. While when we talk about the obligation being divisible or indivisible, that does not refer to the tie that binds the parties, but it refers to the nature of the obligation. Article 1225 actually gives you a definition or a guide as to how to determine whether your obligation is divisible or indivisible. So let's read Article 1225. It reads, For the purposes of the preceding articles, obligations to give definite things and those which are not susceptible of partial performance shall be deemed to be indivisible. What does that tell you? It tells you that if the obligation is to give definite things and such thing cannot be physically divided, then the obligation is indivisible. Another, another principle that your Article 1225 Paragraph 1 is also telling you is that for obligations to do or in rendering a service or performance of a service, it also can be classified as either divisible or indivisible. And in the first paragraph of Article 1225, it says that if it is not capable of partial performance, then it is considered as an indivisible obligation. Now let's move on to the second paragraph of that same article, Article 1225. It reads, When the obligation has, for its object, the execution of a certain number of days of work, the accomplishment of work by metrical units, or analogous things, which by the, their nature are susceptible of partial performance, it shall be divisible. So now it tells you that if an obligation is to do something or it is rendering of a service, then it will be considered divisible if it can be accomplished um, by days of work or there is the accomplishment in metrical units because then there is a measure of how you can divide the work. And so, you treat it as a divisible obligation. So basically, when you look at the first two paragraphs of Article 1225, it basically tells you that to determine whether the obligation is divisible or indivisible, you look at the object of the obligation. If it is the giving of a definite thing, then you consider it as indivisible. If it is 
the performance, the obligation is to perform a service or to render a service or an obligation to do, then it would depend on whether it can be accomplished by a number of days of work or it can be um, measured by metrical units because if it can, then it is divisible. If it can't, then it is indivisible. The third paragraph of Article 1225 gives an exception. It reads, however, even though the object or service may be physically divisible, an obligation is indivisible if so provided by law or intended by the parties. So here we have the parties determining or treating rather a divisible object as an indivisible one. And so they are bound by that treatment or that agreement or if the law treats it as indivisible. An example of an object or a thing that can be treated by the parties as indivisible is, that, let's say for example, money. Money is clearly divisible. It can be divided. But if the parties agree to treat it as indivisible, then so be it because contracts or agreements between the parties have the force of law between them and they are bound by that agreement. So these are the two exceptions for when divisible obligations, which by nature are actually divisible, are treated as indivisible by the parties. Again, either by their agreement or second because the law treats it as indivisible. Now let's have a take a look at Article 1224. This now brings a situation where the obligation is an indivisible one, but the tie between the parties is a joint one. As I've mentioned earlier, when we talk about it being joint and solidary, that refers to the tie between the parties. While when we talk about it being divisible or indivisible, we actually look into the object of the obligation. Now, Article 1224 brings about an obligation that is joint but indivisible. 1224 provides, A joint indivisible obligation gives rise to indemnity for damages from the time any one of the debtors does not comply with his undertaking. The debtors who may have been ready to fulfill their promises shall not contribute to the indemnity beyond the corresponding portion of the price of the thing or of the value of the service in which the obligation consists. Your Article 1224 is actually very much related to Article 1209 of the Civil Code that talks about joint and solidarity obligations. Now, let's go back to 1224. Again, it says there that it's joint and indivisible. Now, how do we go about this? Remember again, when we talk about it being joint and solidarity, it talks about the tie between the parties. And very basic is the principle in a joint obligation where we say that the debtors are, are, are on its own. In other words, if one of the debtors becomes insolvent and the other debtors will not be liable for his share. That's why we have that principle to each his own in joint obligations such that if one of the debtors would be in delay, then the other debtors will not be liable for damages as opposed to a solidary liability where the principle behind it is the act of one is the act of all. So if one is negligent or if one incurs delay, then all the other solidary debtors shall be liable for damages. That is just one of the difference between your joint and solidarity. Now in Article 1224, it speaks of an obligation being joint in other words, the principle behind the tie between the debtors would now be to each his own, but the obligation is indivisible, meaning the nature of the object of the obligation is indivisible. To better understand this provision, let me give you an example. For example, A and B 
bound themselves jointly to deliver a particular car to X. So A and B now agree that their liability is joint. In other words, the principle behind it is to each his own. If B becomes insolvent, then A will not be burdened by his share. If B becomes or rather incurs delay, then A will not also be liable. Why is this um, example indivisible? Because when you look at the object of the obligation, it is the giving of a definite thing that by nature cannot be divided. And that is the measure being given by Article 1225. So in that obligation that I just gave, A and B being bound or being liable to deliver a particular card to X, that is a joint indivisible obligation. Now, supposing the debt is now due and demandable, the agreement on when they will deliver it has already arrived, and X now demands the delivery of that particular car. A is willing and ready to comply with his obligation, but B refuses to comply. Because there is already a demand that was made by X, it is now incumbent upon A and B to deliver. But then again, as I've mentioned, A is willing to comply, but B refuses to comply. In one of our, of our videos, I have already explained that if there is already a demand and you do not comply, then there is already delay. And we have also already discussed this in one of the videos that if you are in delay, then you are liable for damages. So now the question is, if they cannot deliver the particular car because B refuses to comply with this obligation, can A, be also, can A also be made liable rather for damages? The answer to that question is in Article 1224. Article 1224 says, The debtors who may have been ready to fulfill their promises shall not contribute to the indemnity beyond the corresponding portion of the price of the thing or of the value of the service in which the obligation consists. What does that tell you? It tells you that A, in our example, cannot be made liable for damages because he was willing to comply with the obligation. It shall only be B who will be liable for damages. Now remember that because it is an indivisible obligation and because one of the joint debtors is not willing to comply, then the delivery of that particular car cannot be done anymore. What happens now to the obligation? The obligation becomes a monetary liability or a monetary obligation because they can no longer deliver that particular car because one of the debtors is unwilling then you convert that obligation to a monetary liability that is why your article 1224 says that the debtor who was willing shall only be liable to contribute to the corresponding portion of the price of the thing that they have promised. So let's say the car is worth two million, the car that they, that they promised to deliver is worth two million. Then he is only liable to pay one million pesos, his share in the joint obligation. But B on the other hand, the, the, the one who refused to comply shall be liable to pay his corresponding portion, which is also 1 million, plus damages. That is what is meant by Article 1224. The reason behind the law for not letting A shoulder any part of the indemnity is because the obligation is joint. Again, the principle behind a joint obligation is to each his own. So there are as many debts as there are debtors. 
So the death of A is his, while the death of B is his. So if B defaults in his obligation, just like in our example, then A should not be punished for it. That is the reason why A cannot be made liable for damages for the default that was committed by B. It shall only be B who will be liable for damages. But of course, since A obliged himself to deliver a particular car, which now cannot be delivered because of B, your Article 1224 says, it's okay A, just deliver the corresponding corresponding portion of the liability. And that is your share without paying damages. Another important thing to remember when we talk about divisible and indivisible obligations is that it is not required that if it's an indivisible obligation that there must only be one debtor or one creditor, nor does it require two or more debtors in a divisible obligation. When we talk about the number of debtors or creditors, that would pertain to it being joint or solidary, but that does not affect the divisibility or the indivisibility of the obligation. So that is another, uh, another thing that we must remember when we are dealing with divisible or indivisible obligations. So that is your Article 1223 to Article 1225 of your Civil Code on divisible and indivisible obligations. Thank you for watching. I hope you learned a thing or two in this video. See you next time in MBL Classroom. I hope you learned something from this video. If you have, please click like, subscribe, and that notification bell so that you will be notified of new video uploads. Thank you for watching. See you next time in MBL Classroom.